one overarching theme as we talk about formation that we're going to spend a lot of time on today with our guest um, is generosity and how generosity connects with formation. I'm curious, Tim, uh, what comes to mind for you when you think about the connection between generosity and formation? Yeah, that's a good question, Lisa. Um, well, I would say when I think about formation, the, the, the first thing I think about is who are we becoming? And when I think of generosity, I think of perhaps what we have. And hmm. the invitation and connection that I, I, I think about the first in the first sense is what kind of a person I'm becoming as it relates to what I have. That's kind of clunky. So I guess another way to phrase it would be, am I becoming more and more generous? Hmm. Is maybe a, a simpler way to get after it. And if I am, why? And if I'm not, why? And honestly, it's easy to give the Sunday school answer on that, but that, you know, of course we all want to be more and more generous, but I think, uh, the invitation is to think through maybe why am I not? And to kind of prayerfully discern that. How about for you? I'm curious. Well, I love how you've, uh, connected questions with this that because I think that's how we're formed, right? That we continually kind of ask ourselves questions and we respond and we grow and, and we're formed. And so even as you think about your generosity, how am I becoming more generous? How am I being shaped and formed? Um, so I've always thought, or oh, no, I shouldn't say I've always thought, but, but certainly since um, in the last 10 or 15 years as I've been working with the foundation and even before that, I worked with Horizon Stewardship and, um, and I... I think discernment is a really key part of our um, formation process because we're listening to how God is calling us to be, right? To be in this world, to be in relationship with God and with one another, that, that discernment is absolutely integral to our formation and being formed. And there's a sense of which in our discernment, we're listening for our God-given calling and purpose. And that for me, generosity is our response to that calling, to that sense of purpose, that, um, that generosity is an opening up of mm -hmm. our, uh, in your case, you know, you were saying like generosity kind of relates to what we have. Well, yeah, all that we have and all that we are. And if we have an openness to, um, not only how God is calling us, but also how we're going to be in the world. Generosity is a way of being. It is an open, generous uh, way of being. And so I just think we can't extricate generosity from formation. No, it makes me think when you talk about the posture, I think about like maybe even for our listeners right now, like as you think about that word generosity, like what would you do with your body? Like what kind of a mm. posture would you hold or what yeah. would you want to hold? Yeah. Um, and yeah, what's in the way. I, I totally yeah. agree. These are intricately linked formation and yeah. generosity. I think so too. So in your work as a nonprofit leader and as a pastor, what are you observing right now in terms of, uh, you know, stewardship, giving, generosity kind of trends? What are you noticing from your perspective? Well, one thing that I'm noticing for sure that in my work with the Parish Collective, we're beginning to experiment more and more with is actually something that um, it's a bit of a sneak peek we'll get into with Joe. And that is um, consistent giving through like a membership kind of an idea. Um, mm. It's there's all different ways of thinking about fundraising and capital campaigns as a church or as a faith-based nonprofit or a nonprofit or even business development for business leaders. But um, something that I'm seeing as, as a bit of a trend is um, 
the for whatever people can afford, there is something I think that's just powerful of saying we're with you. Like hmm. this mission, this organization matters and let's just, let's do this together. And that feels a little different than you could say kind of the marketplace idea of like, well, what am I going to get? Um, so I, I'm seeing that as a little bit of a trend. I guess it's a little bit of a hope. Um, and then, you know, yeah. this um, podcast is going to live for a long, long time, but lots of people are talking about a recession that could be amongst us. And so mm -hmm. the anxiety that might be happening within families and individuals all across the country and, and around the world, is just a real thing. And so I think that kind of prayerfully discerning our capacities and generosities within um, a time where there might be financial hardships is just something I mean, it's not, that's not a trend per se. It's more something that I'm just, I'm thinking about. Um, yeah. Paying attention to. And, yeah. Yeah. So I find this notion of um, helping folks think about how they invest in the community in which you're a part. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I think churches need to be thinking about how they're invested in their neighborhood. But I also think when we become part of a faith community, how are we investing with all that we are in this community, this faith community that we believe in and that we, um, and that we believe has the ability to have an impact, you know, that, that we say, I'm all in, I'm all, all in with my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, my witness, my, you know, that I'm all in and and that you think about that, that we invite folks to think about what that looks like in really tangible ways in their lives. And um, Yeah, and going off really that, important. Lisa, I, I think too, um, maybe this is sort of obvious, but we all know, we've talked about this in the past, that relationships and even change grows at the speed of trust. And there's mm -hmm. just nothing it's particularly if you're leading a church or organization that says like, oh, we trust each other of a financial gift. It's actually real. It's way bigger than like the dollar amount. I think it has, it's like, it's a visible sign you could say of trust. And mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful and important right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it is biblical when, I mean, where your treasure is there, your heart is. Yep. And, and I think sometimes we think that text is actually the other way around, but it's not. It's where your treasure is, <laughs> there your heart is. And so there is something really tangible about financially investing, if you will, in a community and, and its ability to have impact that changes our heart, um, that connects us together. And, and uh, that's powerful. Yeah. Well, our guest today is Joe Park, who has been leading clergy and congregations in stewardship and generosity for decades now. And Tim, I'm going to invite you to, to read his bio. Tell us a little bit about Joe. I would love to tell everybody about Joe. He is the CEO and principal of Horizon Stewardship, whose mission is to help churches and faith-based nonprofits grow disciples and fund ministry. And that team, Horizons, has assisted churches in raising over $9 billion. That is a B, billion, in capital funding and unaccountable amounts of annual and planned giving. Prior to Horizons, in 2002, he served as, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, the CEO of Community Financial Group with banks in seven cities. So he also has experience as a CEO of a bank. He's consulted and taught extensively on the implementation of best practices in generosity, strategic planning, and change management. He got um, a degree in finance and banking from, I think, what's very beloved to him, University of Arkansas, yeah. and a master's degree in MBA from Boston University. Joe and his family live in Dallas. And I think one of the other very interesting things about Joe that we should let our listeners know about um, this is a little vague at the end that actually Joe is your beloved spouse. Is that not true? Yes, he is. So <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I'm a, a big fan, um, for sure. 
and and uh, and so it's been it's fun to have places where our ministries overlap. Um, for sure. Well, I know there's a lot to get into here with this episode, but I'm curious. I mean, you have, um, I would imagine, talk about this kind of stuff all the time. Is there anything that kind of particularly surprised you, Lisa, or, or, or stuck out with you in this conversation? Right. So what I would say is, and, and, and not so much surprise as I, every time I hear him talk about it, I just am reminded of where his heart is. And that is that everything he does is about growing disciples. I mean, it's even in, I mean, it's in Horizon's purpose statement. We we help churches and, and nonprofits grow disciples and fund ministry. And so when we were thinking about this season and, and about uh, formation and how we're being formed and how, and the church's role in formation and how that role is changing, um, really Joe came to mind because at the heart of everything they do, it's about forming disciples and, um, and helping churches do that. And so, um, it, it just comes out all through the conversation that we had with Joe. It sure does. Yeah. So let's listen to our conversation with Joe. Hi, Joe. Thanks for being with us. Welcome, Lisa. Happy to be here. So, Joe, as you know, this season is all about formation in the church. And so um, we want to uh, start getting to know you a little bit and introduce you to our audience with that theme in mind. And uh, I happen to know a little bit about this story of yours, but will you share with our listeners how you went from being a bank CEO to working with churches around generosity? Yeah, I, um, I felt a call to ministry and it would be um, an understatement to uh, let's just, let's back that up so I felt a call to ministry and in truth it took me years to really discern that out because it was the last thing that um, I was expecting but I I did hear clarity will you serve me in full-time ministry and so um, I had already been on the board of Horizon Stewardship uh, so Cliff Christopher our founder came to me and said well this is perfect you can come and, and be a part of Horizons and my reaction was good Lord Cliff no God called me into ministry and, and not fundraising <laughs> um, so I had resigned my job and and was looking for um, seminaries to attend uh, and Cliff said why don't you come and hang out with me and and maybe that will clarify um, what you're calling because I had no sense that I was to fill a pulpit so all I can imagine at that point was that I could be a missionary uh, so those are the two choices, right? <laughs> a pulpit or that's what I understood them to be. Um, yeah. in, in my limited uh, experience in the churches that I've been with, so um, I began to hang out with them, and and it was really uh, when he sent me to spend some time with Bill Esom that I began to realize that the passion behind me was discipleship, mm. and so. Um, I came back to Cliff and I explained that and he said, well, you can't really make a living doing that, but they'll pay you ridiculous amounts of money to uh, raise money for churches. So why don't you try mixing those two together? And that's really what I began to do for three years is, is sort of go on a walkabout trying to explore that. And if we fast forward um, now, almost 22 years later, um, I've got real clarity around that. And Horizon's mission, that's the ministry that I lead, is to help churches and faith-based institutions grow disciples and secondarily to fund ministry. So that's how I got into it. It was messy. It was hard. Um, and it, it took me a long time to sort of find my uh, my place in that because I had these preconceived notions about what ministry was. And um, God had something entirely different in mind. I was just slow to learn it. It's beautiful, Joe. I wonder if you could um, maybe take us 
uh, another few steps on the path because in these many, many years, you've become really an expert in generosity. And, um, you know, maybe this is a bit simple to start off with, but I, I'm really curious about your thoughts on the connection, either personally or kind of what you're seeing now between generosity and spiritual formation. How are these two connected or not? How does this affect your life and work and your imagination for the ministry that you're doing? Well, let me first start off to say that um, while I appreciate the compliment of being called a, a generosity expert, in reality, um, I, I don't think anybody fully is an expert. I, um, I, I'm a student, I'm a lifelong learner, and I'm passionate about it. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, I had a hard time uh, connecting the generosity work with the discipleship and, until I was really able to connect those dots that um, I mentioned to you earlier. Um, for me, uh, being a former banker, let's just start with the numbers, uh, the importance of discipleship and, and the connection that it has to fundraising. Um, one of our uh, client churches uh, did a study where they had a data scientist come in and, and look at their most connected people and ask of those who attend worship at least one time a month, what is their connection to giving? And I won't go into the backstory of, of how they calculate percent of income, uh, but here's what they found. And we find this at Horizons to be um, uh, pretty accurate in terms of what we experience in the, in the thousands of churches we worked with. What they learn is that those that attend worship one time a month give about 1% of their income. If they attend more than two times a month, they give about 2% of their income. But if they are involved in a, a life-changing small group uh, where there's spiritual formation, where they're sending, uh, where there's community, then they give somewhere between 3 and 4% uh, of their income. And that's really true if somebody is involved in ministry as well. So when you, you think about it, um, if you look at the most engaged people, those that are um, involved in a small group, group where they're growing spiritually, and then those that are serving in a ministry are giving three or four times what someone who's attending church one or two times a month. And most churches would consider that to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a committed person, but there's a clear corollary. Uh, and that has allowed us to to back in sort of measuring and say that there's a clear connection between discipleship and uh, generosity. So we like to um, describe what we do as creating cultures of generosity. And, and I want to um, separate that from this idea of fundraising. Now, you can raise funds using a needs-based approach that says, we're doing a good thing. Um, we need additional funds. Will you help us achieve our mission? But if you're going to create a culture of generosity, that requires an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it, it's my experience that that most often happens within the context of relationship. And, and that is most often done in the church in the form of discipleship, small groups and, um, and serving. And so from my perspective, there's a very clear corollary between discipleship and um, funding ministry. And so what we like to say is that generosity is a byproduct of your discipleship uh, pathway. How effective you are at growing disciples of Jesus Christ um, is going to, more than anything else, impact your ministry funding. Fabulous. I think if we could all, as pastors and leaders in the church, understand that deep connection, that creating a culture of generosity is really about encounters with the Holy Spirit. And, and so then we're not thinking, 
gosh, how do we raise this money? We're thinking, how do we help people connect with the Holy Spirit, you know, grow closer to God, open their eyes and ears and hearts to the ways that God is working? Like that's a very different set of practices, if you will, for leaders in the church. And and frankly, that's what we're we're trained for. That's where our heart is. And which feels so um uh, you know, feel so in line with our calling where sometimes when we think fundraising, we're like, Oh, I don't know. And we dread and. Well, because fundraising is really, um, the idea of getting something from someone and mm-hmm. developing a culture of generosity, discipleship, you're wanting something for them. You're wanting them to experience the joy of generosity, to become more like Christ. And, um, when we approach ministry funding um, from a perspective of of getting something from somebody, it, it is awkward and it's it's painful and it's hard and it's it's uh, not what we recommend. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So um, many of our listeners are pastors, as you know, and and. Um, and so we, we really, we want this conversation to be one, both um, encouraging as we think about what it is to do faith formation, um, but also super practical. And um, one of the things that, um, that I've heard you talk about so much is um, what it means to move from kind of here's your one Sunday or your three Sundays where you, you know, you drive hard on, um, giving um, and move toward a kind of year round approach to generosity. And, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. You know, why is a year round approach important? Um, You know, what do, what can congregations be thinking about? And I give that back to you. (laughs) Yeah. So the idea um, around, a year-round approach is really born out of this idea we are creating cultural change. It's discipleship. So um, it, it, when you think of it in that context, you realize it is an ongoing um it is an ongoing process as opposed to a, a transaction. So when we think of generosity as something that we do in the season, we're much more likely to be doing uh, fundraising than really trying to build a um, culture of generosity. And so what we recommend uh, churches think about is um a year-round integrated funding model that is uh, based on um, a series of disciplines. Now, in our case, we recommend or, or we describe those buckets of best practices that we call disciplines as keeping it spiritual, uh, telling your impact story, building relationships, making the ask or a call to action might be another way to say that and measuring effectiveness. And what we imagine uh, and what we teach around uh, year-round generosity is to create a single process um, that uses the same language, that uses the same theology, so that you're building upon those um, practices when you're addressing annual giving, uh, capital giving, special giving, plan giving, uh, so that the donor um, is hearing very familiar messages. You're just looking for to fund different things. And and very often that means for them a different funding source, like um, annual giving is largely done out of uh, earnings. Uh, Capital giving is frequently done out of stored wealth. And plan giving is is out of uh, um, your estate most often. But when you build a firm foundation using the same disciplines, the same words, a clear theology of generosity, then um, 
it, it is much easier for uh, donors to, to really have that experience with the uh, holy because they're connecting the dots as opposed to uh, this episodic fundraising where we'd use different words and different techniques and different um, ideas. And what it's left us with is a situation, if we just think about language around generosity, if you ask most Christians, they would um, describe the tithe, for instance, is whatever they put in the offering plate. And when they begin to understand the tithe as 10% of their income, then it allows us to um, uh, begin to make clear calls to action. It allows us to measure effectiveness as we invite them to be percentage givers as they move toward and beyond a tithe. And that beyond a tithe is called an offering, but we've mixed all that together. And so it's very murky to most Christians what we are really asking for, because we mix words together, we mix messages, and, and then we use different um, approaches that just feel foreign to what they experienced before. That's so interesting, Joe. I, I'm, I'm curious about, you work with pastors and congregational leaders and teams, I understand, like, all over the place. And I would have I would imagine that there are pastors and lay leaders listening right now that are like, yeah, like this is good news. I don't want the kind of anxious, just like frenetic, how do I squeeze money out of people kind of strategy. I don't know anyone who really would, um, but it does feel like that's kind of the default. What you're inviting us into is culture change. It's, um, the formative imagination of generosity yes. for people that are listening in now. And even in this, this conversation, if they're like, okay, you got me, I'm ready, but I don't quite know how to begin to shift that culture. How do you recommend? I, I think, especially whoever's tasked with it, it's a lead elder or a pastor. I want to create this shift. I know it's not going to happen overnight. What are some ideas that you might have as to how to begin to turn the tide towards a culture of generosity? So a culture of generosity is best formed when there's some clarity around uh, the basics of the why we exist question, because essentially today, um, churches have to answer two questions to their donor households. Why give and why give to us? And so that really begins with clarity of mission, vision, and values, as well as clarity around a theology of generosity. What do each of the words mean? What does the Bible tell us about generosity? And so if you think about it from a communication perspective, because so much of generosity work is actually communication, that theology of generosity becomes like a style guide that pulls everything together. Um, and so it allows for a clarity of message. And then th the most important piece in my mind is a discipleship pathway. Now, that can be described in a lot of different ways, but essentially being very clear how we are growing um, uh, disciples of Jesus Christ so the world can be transformed into the world that God imagined. And so most often the elements of that are worship, um, spiritual formation, and small groups. And that to me is by far the most important piece. If you want to dig into that, we can. Uh, then it's getting people involved in service, and then also including generosity as part of that. So we don't sort of bury it uh, under some obscure language. We're, we're upfront and clear that we are looking for persons to grow in each one of these uh, areas. And, and we talk in ways that are measurable. 
talk in ways of, of um, expectations in terms of um, worship participation, in terms of being engaged in a small group, in terms of the importance of giving back and serving, um, you know, with our hands and, and to be generous with what God has given us to steward. So that's a starting place. And then beyond that um, would be this use of a, uh, an integrated funding model um, where you're working within those disciplines. And each one of those disciplines is really a bucket of a lot of best practices. So the idea is to create a generosity team. And the, the reason that um, we use the word generosity team is that um, if you're trying to drive cultural change, you need to be able to touch all aspects of the church. So you've got to have someone that represents what's happening in worship, someone who represents what's happening in um, small groups, Sunday school classes. You've got to have somebody that's representing uh, missions and somebody who's representing administration um, and, and some one who um, is able to drive change at the church level. So when you, you think about a finance team, they're not really empowered to change the culture. Uh, they, they don't really have an impact on, on what's said on Sunday morning. They usually don't have access to uh, what's happening in um, small groups or what's uh, occurring, they're generally worrying about expenses. And of course, the reason they're worrying about expenses is because we haven't provided them enough information about giving. So they're looking at a they're looking at an income statement that says, you know, loose plate offerings, pledge giving, uh, or uh, estimates of giving, um, uh, uh, free will giving, and then they get pages and pages of expenses. So that's where they spend their time as opposed to being a part of growing um, disciples. So a few other things that um, are really helpful, uh, and that would be the offering talk. This probably is the most important tool that a pastor or a church has available to them. Uh, two or three minutes where you're telling a story of impact, um, literally putting a face on it. Facts and figures are not a story of impact, but when you, you name a person, when you can show a face uh, and you can describe what is different because they were served, because they learned to give, um, their, that transformation, that along with a well-cultivated ask where you're connecting some important pieces. Like for instance, whenever you talk about generosity, you want to talk about spiritual growth. Those two are intimately connected. When you talk about giving, you want to talk about impact. And we fail to make those connections clearly before the church and then fail to give a call to action. This is what we're asking of you in this moment. And this is how you can act. We want to make those clear and Don Smith has written a book called A Better Offering uh, that walks a church through the process of creating these offering talks because that two to three minutes takes a long time to uh, create. You've got to get the story. You've got to, to get pictures, video. Um, you've got to line up a speaker. But that storytelling it's one of the disciplines. Um, if that can be recorded, it can also be sent to the three quarters of the church or 80% of the church that's not in attendance on that Sunday. It can be loaded into, um, into social me uh, media. And again, it isn't just the story, but it, it's what we're asking the person to do to grow in their relationship, the call to action that um, is also important. Donor analytics are key. 
um, to measuring. So um, there's some good choices out there. Uh, coaching, if this is unfamiliar to you. And Horizons has an, a free on-demand resource library called Giving365. You can find that at giving365.com. It is full of all kinds of how-tos. Um, it, it can, we'll talk about how to increase recurring giving, how to do a good um, offering talk, how to set up a generosity team, how to make uh, an effective ask. So all of that's there for someone who wants to avail themselves of it. Oh my gosh, you said so much. This is so good. This is so good. Like all this practical wisdom. Um, one of the things that I was on my mind is before we even got together for this podcast Joe was um, thinking like, what practical advice or next steps would you give to congregations and to leaders, especially in this season? Like here we are at the end of the year and sometimes folks are going, oh, you know, this has been a tough year or I don't know how we're going to finish the year. And you've given such practical things. And I'm just going to recap a couple of them. Although what I love is that, and we'll put your link in the show notes um, to, to giving 365. Cause I love that you're not only just sharing this, but you're saying, Hey, this is available to you. We want to be a resource. And so, um, but a couple of things that you said that stood out to me, one is this notion of putting a team together. So often the pastor feels the weight of it and the blame, frankly, for how we're doing financially. And, and you're really encouraging. And if you have a smaller church, like pull together some key lay folks who are willing to take some of these pieces, but put a team together that looks at the whole picture of the church and, um, and the importance of stories of telling the stories of life change, because every single day, every week, churches are making a difference in lives of, of folks from the youngest to the oldest. And so just telling some of those stories and being able to tell it broadly, whether that's on social media, you know, or, um, in your e-news or other ways beyond worship and, um, and being sure that, that people know how to take their next step so that there's always, you call it a call to action, but there's a sense of, okay, I hear this story now, now how can I participate in the impact that this church is doing? And that feels really important. And, um, and I know I've heard you say this, you just mentioned it briefly, but this notion of recurring giving, and I've, seen churches that made such a huge difference, especially in the pandemic where folks got used to giving digitally and that that has sustained their, their giving where it used to be a little more cyclical and episodic depending on the seasons and, and especially like summer, you know, but when you can, you can get folks to uh, give, digitally and in a recurring fashion that keeps it a little more steady for churches. So I so appreciate the practical wisdom that you have given folks in this. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I no, want to shift key. Oh, go ahead, Tim, go. Oh, oh just, just to also double click on some things that Joe said that I think um, are just so helpful, so valuable, especially this time of year. Um, as we get to kind of think about the, like what our financial picture might look like for our churches. Um, I think it's a big deal for what, you, for what you're saying. Tell me if I'm off on this, but what I hear you saying essentially is as you get clear about your why, your purpose, that's foundational. And then as you invite the, the stories of transformation, the people, the characters that are um, from within our community, what you're doing is you're you're telling a story, a true story, by the way, that the entire congregation gets to live into. And so the shift, yeah. it feels like within me is like, rather than like, this is a duty or something we have to do, which may or may not be true. It's more of like, we get to do this. Like, this is pretty incredible. Week after week, as I just think about kind of the moment in talking about the offering, it's it's a time of celebration. And we all know that what we celebrate within organizations is a result of the culture that we have. And so I, I really feel like this is a key thing that you're giving us is it's, it's a really profound gift um, and does feel like it comes all the way back to how you began, which is it's not just what you do, it's who you are, it's who you're becoming, which is why this is ultimately a question of spirit formation. I just think it's fantastic. 
So one resource I didn't talk about uh, that I often recommend as a starting point is a speech that um, theologian Henry Nouwen wrote in nine, or gave in 1960-something. It's called The Spirituality of Fundraising, uh, and that has been published by his family foundation into uh, a short book. And, and while I wish he hadn't used the word um, fundraising, uh, the I recommend that churches, uh, leadership groups, staff start there if they have, if they're looking to begin um, this journey, because it will give you a common language that you can each draw upon. And, and when you begin to move through those disciplines and create this generosity team, this culture of change, this year-round generosity, that is an easy uh, foundational piece to continue to draw upon and very often for uh, pastors and lay persons to um, find courage uh, because what they realize is that it isn't about them. They're merely inviting people um, to join God in what God is already doing and to uh, invest all of themselves in that. And and that is a, a joyful and exciting thing. Yeah, I, I couldn't recommend that book enough. For folks who haven't read it, if you just kind of Google Henry Nouwen and fundraising, I think you'll find it. It's a thin little book. I read it every year. It's one of the greatest nice. resources uh, there yeah. is. And you're right. It gives courage because over time it can feel like the default kind of uh, anxieties around fundraising, just they, they creep in um, this book. Like is, a it, song. You center yourself with it. You, you can drift. <laughs> and this is a, the, it, that annual reading. Uh, that's a, a great idea to um, recenter yourself. Yeah. It's a phenomenal book. Nice, nice. So one of the questions that we have long asked at, at, uh, around our house at TMF is, um, and so it, it, you're familiar enough, Joe, with TMF to know we've, we've had these conversations, but um, the question is, um, who taught you to be generous, Joe? You're obviously a, a generous person, and I know that of you, um, but who taught you to be generous? You know, it, it wasn't a um, it wasn't a, a single person or single event. It really, um, for me, was um, was growing. I, I um, in my family of origin, I experienced a generosity in relationships, a generosity of presence of of. of working together and caring for um, each other. And um, there's uh, a few other, so, but we really didn't talk about money very much. Uh, so I didn't have um, a good sense of that. And um, I had a friend sit me down um, uh, and his name is Clint Miller. And uh, he was a farm bureau agent in town and I just moved to town and and uh, he said, I, I just want to share something with you um, that someone shared with me that was a life change. And he talked to me about a biblical tithe, which was not something I was very um, familiar with. And so um, I began to, to think about that and try that on. And, and it actually became a bit of a source of pride for me because I thought, well, all these other areas in my life, I'm missing the mark, but I'm tithing 10% of my income. And so, you know, that's really got to make God proud of me. And, and then um, a, a Baptist, uh, I be, I'm a, a bit of a, my spiritual journey has led me through a number of, of different denominations. And there was a, a Baptist preacher, Dale Medlin, um, in the course of a, a capital campaign who challenged me to think about giving beyond a tithe, that really the tithe was the starting point of generosity, that that's what God asked us to um, set aside, to remind us, this is my personal theology on that, to remind us of, of God's goodness um, in our lives. But what we do with the 90% um, is, is really um, 
an indicator of where we are on our in our spiritual journey and he helped me walk through that and, and surprised me by making some um, connections and um, I've also had the joy in this work of working with hundreds of generous people who share their passion and excitement and joy uh, around generosity. And um, I, I want to say um, also my wife, Lisa, um, teaching me generosity of grace, which really sort of pulls it all together. Um, and um, uh, helps me with grace for myself, helps me with um, grace for others. And I think it makes me a better person. You're sweet, Joe. You have also um, been one of the people who has shaped my own understanding of and practice of generosity. So um, we're, we're a good partnership, friend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think, you know, as we think about those, um, those who have taught us to be generous in our lives, um, you think that really is formation. I mean, when you go back to your family of origin and you said, you know, really, it's not that we talked about money, but I learned about generosity. I learned about being outwardly focused and, thinking about other and how do we share what we have in ways and um, whether that's, um, you know, sharing a meal or sharing your home or, um, you know, all the ways you learn to be. And that formed you so that when you had that tithe conversation or that what do you do with your 90% conversation, that generosity of spirit is something that had formed and shaped you. And I, I, I feel that way too. I look back and think about the ways that I've been formed as a, as a human being by my faith, by my family, that, um, that makes generosity a way, a, a lens through which we see how we engage the world. Um, and that feels really important as we talk about formation. Yeah. So we're asking all of our guests a final question. And that is, what is one way that you're being formed right now? And what difference is that making for you? Hmm. Maybe that's two questions. <laughs> well, it's when, yeah, Go it's ahead, probably a messy answer. Um, uh, because it, I am still so much in the process of being formed, very much a, a work in progress around this. And so um, for me, it is uh, almost a, a daily discovery, but it uh, might best be um, described as making space at the table, uh, particularly as it relates to um, women. I visited uh, Israel, um, gosh, a year and a half ago and a place called Magdala um, where this is the town Mary Magdalene lived in and um, there's a hall of women there that celebrates women of the Bible and I, I think there are 12 um, pillars and one it, um, celebrates the women that were not named and those that continue uh, to be influential in developing the faith and, and looking around and, and thinking there's just 12. Uh, and then we walked down underneath that hall is an old, uh, is a synagogue. And there's a painting of the bleeding woman who was touching Jesus's hem. And when I walked in and saw that something in me changed and I walked out different and I, I knew I was walking out different um, but what is different about me uh, and, and, and and I'm still learning um, but I would say that the my eyes have been opened to um, 
the structural obstacles that um, we well-meaning white men in power have um, put in place, sometimes not well-meaning, but have put in place that um, really says, uh, if you'll be like us, you're welcome here. And it's sadly, that's what so many of our churches are doing, is if, if you like our kinds of music and, and you behave the way we want you to be, then you're welcome here. And if not, we're going to kind of give you the stink eye. And I have this, um, this awareness of how I've contributed to not making space at the table for everyone, um, people of color, um, women in particular, uh, and, and, and others who may not uh, be like me or uh, agree with me. And so, like I said, I'm very much a work in progress and, and, and trying hard to um, uh, come in line with God's best plan for me. But I have a lot of bad patterns and, and habits and, and, and cultural cues that um, I, I've got to learn to overcome. So that's really, the for me, um, the big work that um, God is doing. And I don't imagine, uh, I imagine I'm going to meet God in person before um, I, uh, uh, before uh, God finishes that work in me. I appreciate your um, vulnerability and transparency in that. I mean, mm -hmm. we're all messy. We're all a work in progress. And, and thanks be to God that God is working, working on and in and through us and, and surrounds us with people who, um, you know, hold up the mirror and love us with grace. And, and uh, that's also the ways that God forms and shapes us. And so thanks for being transparent in that and and sharing your own messiness with all of us who are just messy human beings in progress right, right. yeah yeah i appreciate your being with us today joe and helping us think about how generosity and formation are so integrally connected mm -hmm.